I'm Brian Hubbard. And I'm Lynn McTaggart. And welcome to yet another podcast or vlogcast where we chat and like two raconteurs about the week's health news and stuff we find interesting and hope you do as well. So without further ado, let's start with the first news item. Now, a lot of older people, and I include myself in that now, Lynn, actually, over 65 will have what is known as elective surgery, which means it's non-critical. You know, you know, you're not about to die, but it could be anything, really. It could be, you know, a sort of any, any operation, really, that you have to, you know, you, you have to book in. Well, anyway... Um, they know that round about 0.5% of people over the age of 65 who have a elective surgery will suffer a stroke. But um, new research said there's something much more worrying going on. And that, they reckon, is 7%. 7% of older people will suffer what is known as a silent stroke, which is one that is not diagnosed. But this silent stroke can produce serious cognitive decline, often within the first year, which could even lead on to dementia or, or even Alzheimer's. Now, the numbers are extraordinary. They reckon about 50 million people around the world who are over the age of 65 have elective surgery every year. Now, if my maths are right, that means three and a half million older people are also suffering a silent stroke as a result. And um, researchers at McMaster University who made the discovery reckon that um, the, the silent stroke doubles the risk of cognitive decline and it can also cause delirium or a TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack, which is like a form of stroke, I suppose, in its own way. And all this can happen within 12 months after the surgery. And they made the discovery after doing an MRI scan to discover this sort of brain damage that occurred were caused by the stroke. So his veins and arteries have been, you know, have been damaged as a result. And uh, yeah, a you know, really serious discovery because so many people do have, have this sort of surgery, but the risk actually is quite significant. Well, this is the concern. I mean, the doctors tend to, and surgeons, tend to talk about how more or less risk-free a lot of elective surgery is, you know, whether you're talking about a rotator cuff, mm. you know, operation um, on your shoulder or, you know, a knee, you know, cleaning out your knee or um, a hysterectomy, something like that. Mm. And it's supposed to be in and out without a problem. <clears throat> but at any point, particularly among older people, um, you could have a stroke. Mm. And certainly this happened to a friend of ours, the late Anne-Marie Colbin, mm. who had heart surgery, was encouraged to have heart surgery. And when she did, she had a stroke on the table and was never the same again mm. Mm. afterward. And it's happened to a number of people we know where they, you know, went on to suffer a stroke yeah. during very, very simple operations. Yeah. So what this really says to me is that medicine has to start focusing on how to fix things without cutting people open, mm. essentially. You know, and there are many, many ways to heal and certainly alternative medicine, the kind of stuff we write about every month demonstrates that pretty much every part of the body can heal. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they say with silent stroke, I mean, it's, it's something that is never diagnosed. So the, the discovery was made only when they did the MRI. So even the patient himself or herself never knew they'd had a stroke. No. But something, you know, something was amiss. And, um, yeah, and 7%, I mean, enormous number. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a concern. Thanks, Lynn. High blood pressure. Loads of people have it, and loads are given a blood pressure drug, an antihypertensive, to treat it. And one of the most uh, frequently prescribed, I suppose, is the calcium channel blocker and uh, that keep uh, high blood pressure under control, or supposed to anyway. 
but they also cause a bowel problem that is known as diverticulosis that affects many elderly people anyway, this problem, but the calcium channel blockers increase that risk further. Diverticulosis is a bowel problem caused with small bulges or pouches in the intestine and left untreated it can lead to diverticulitis when the pouches become inflamed. Eventually it can be life-threatening and may need emergency treatment if the pouches burst or become infected. Now the problem in any event affects up to 65% of the over 85s and so this common blood pressure drug is increasing that risk even further. Now, it's researchers at the Imperial College London tested uh, calcium channel blockers against another antihypertensive, the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, and discovered it was just the calcium channel blockers that increased the risk for this um, bowel disorder. Uh, they don't really know why it is, but they think it may be something to do with the way it affects the ability of muscles in the intestine to push food through the gut. Um, and they made the discovery, what is, I suppose, equally as interesting, it's a whole new way of testing drugs. It's called genetic testing. And whereas with most drug trials, I mean, they take forever, they, they are open to all sorts of interpretation, intended or otherwise, depending on who's paying for the research. And um, this actually just looks at genetic sampling. So it is um, truly independent and it allows people to come to very quick results and make discoveries that very often these we uh, these controlled trials never ever see or, or, or realize are happening could because you know again we go around this very very familiar loop where you know you, people can suffer a side effect to a drug but because it's not listed no one no one assumed it was the drug in the first place that caused it so it never gets recorded so this goes on and on whereas this genetic testing is a whole new way to see the benefits and true side effects in their multiple glory of, of drugs. That's so interesting, Brian, the, mm. that they can finally see what's mm. going on. Yeah. Um, and then that means, I mean, if someone independent can do it, ah. and uh, mm -hmm. that you don't have to spend tons on it, yeah. which usually requires the drug company itself, mm -hmm. that means it's not open to manipulation yeah. as the drug company always does mm -hmm. in just about most cases. Um, but it also says something about um, blood pressure drugs. I mean, one of the big problems with heart disease anyway, and I mean, we've written a whole book on the subject, um, which is What Doctors Don't Tell You's Guide to Heart Disease, and it's available on Amazon in the UK mm. and the US. Mm. Um, and we've looked at uh, drugs for blood pressure and other aspects of heart disease and we found there is a tendency not only to dispense this stuff if someone has higher blood pressure something that can easily easily be controlled by diet and supplements mm. but they dispense it and also <laughs> there's the attitude well if one drug is good two are better mm. and what they oftentimes do with heart disease is prescribe um, a beta blocker with a calcium channel blocker, thinking that they're both complementary. The problem is they aren't. They do more or less the same thing. Beta blockers haven't been shown to cause diverticulosis or diverticulitis, but they can um, cause antagonistic effects with the other drug. So before moving on to a whole course of a load of drugs, for something that can be controlled by diet, we really urge you to look for alternatives and you know you can find them in What Doctors Don't mm. Tell You the magazine and also right here. Yeah. And I think that generally is, the, is a wider issue. I mean this genetic testing is fascinating but even then what it can't do is test for the whole cocktail of drugs, you know polypharmacy as it's known, that people are, are given. I mean over the age of 65 the average number of drugs being taken by someone is round about 10. <laughs> and as in some cases, the study has shown that up to 30 drugs have been taken 
over the age of 65. Well, I mean, what on earth is going on? It's a complete chemistry set. Yes. And no one knows the interaction of these drugs. And I guess even genetic testing isn't going to do that. But, you know, it's, it really is quite alarming, I think. Lynn. I just, Absolutely. Yeah. And if you suffer from, you know, various kinds of heart disease, whether it's atrial fibrillation or, or high blood pressure, seek an alternative before you go on a load of mm. drugs. Thanks, Lynn. So why is it that we're still banging on with chemotherapy, radiotherapy and surgery? I mean, chemo was introduced in about 1947 or so, and we're still using this as a frontline treatment for most cancers. And the new therapies that we all have hope for, like immunotherapy and many other things, just aren't really pushing through in the way that we might have hoped. So why is that? Well, the answer could be because no one's actually researching it. Um, this is how it works. Drug trials are paid for by drug companies. Drug companies want to test the drug that they're manufacturing so they can give all sorts of reinforcement to the doctor as to why they should prescribe it. So a positive review is required and usually is delivered. So if drug companies are researching the drugs that they produce, who's researching the other stuff, the non-drug approaches? Well, the answer is nobody. And um, a review of independent uh, drug trials, which is meant to be uh, funded by the non-profits, just isn't getting through to the right places. And all the uh, most common cancers, and certainly the deadliest, are not being researched as a result. Now, it seems really lame as to why this is happening. The non-profits are donating millions, if not billions, for this independent research. But the cancers are not being uh, researched, or the therapies for these cancers are not being researched. Why? Well, because some of the cancers are a bit embarrassing, say researchers at Northwestern University. So presumably colon cancer is embarrassing. Oh, their cancers have been stigmatized like lung cancer. I mean, to me, this is utterly extraordinary that these could be reasons why these cancers and the therapies, the new therapies for them, are being uh, ignored. Uh, breast cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, and children's cancers are getting independent funding and are being researched. The research is discovered, but the forgotten cancers include colon, endometrial, liver and bile duct, cervical, ovarian, pancreatic and lung cancers. These are not being reviewed. The new therapies for them are not being tested. And um, believe it or not, one of the researchers said it's to do with shame and discomfort. We're talking about our bowels and private parts. I mean, these are doctors. Um, this is utterly extraordinary. Um, and uh, they found out by they they looked at 119 major non-profit organizations that made nearly six billion dollars in contributions to cancer research. And of course, the trouble is, you know, if it's not getting researched and not being found to be good, it ain't going to enter the mainstream. Doctors, oncologists are not going to use it because there's no evidence that it works, and there's no evidence because no one's researching it. <laughs> It's just, you know, it's part of that horrible black hole that is cancer research. Mm. And um, one of the biggest problems of all, of course, is the, you know, the tight grip that the drug companies do have mm. on drug research. I wouldn't put it past them to have a more insidious reason for why these cancers aren't Investigating. Well, one reason, Lynn, is because chemo drugs are the single most expensive drugs in the world. I was just about to say this. <laughs> I mean, this is their cash cow. You know, they mm. don't want to have something mm. else that doesn't require chemo um, mm. to be on board. Um, they can charge any old price they mm. want for chemo drugs. Mm. And, you know, hospitals and uh, organizations like the National Health Service in the UK have to pay it. Well, I mean, it's worse in the States, isn't it? Whether you've seen sometimes a hundredfold increase 
in the cost of chemo drugs over the last 10 years. And because it's an insurance-based system, it's being paid. I mean, National Health Service is a UK taxpayer-funded service, and there's more controls over this, and we're not seeing the same price hikes. But in America, it's, it's just licensed to, to make money. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, so, you know, we're wanting to see a lot of alternatives coming through, and, and we're just not. So. And also, I mean, uh, <clears throat> certain things are, are, you know, are discouraged, made illegal, uh, driven out. Mm. I mean, there have been many, many doctors coming up with novel ways to treat mm. cancer mm. who have been, or, or clinics, mm. who have been pushed out of the U.S. They've had mm. to operate in Mexico or in, you know, one of the islands off of America um, in order to carry on. Or the people have been demonized or their equipment confiscated or whatever, you know, under mm. the idea that this is, you know, protecting the public. What mm. it's doing is protecting the drug companies and preventing the public from getting any innovation mm. and anything that is not a chemo drug. Yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about uh, alternatives to chemo that can work. And um, one piece of research that has come out, but it is one of those cancers that is favoured anyway for research, and that's leukaemia. And uh, researchers have discovered that good old fever few, the common garden plant, already known to um, combat migraine and arthritic pain, also kills leukaemia. And uh, normally considered a chronic and incurable cancer, in fact, is being reversed by good old fever through, and in particular, a compound in it, partholide, um, seems to be doing the job. University of Birmingham research have done some laboratory tests on leukemia cells and uh, discovered the compound is killing those cells off. Um, in fact, what it, well, it's sort of killing off what it is they self-destruct. There's some sort of biological mechanism that takes place, um, and uh, the, the cancer cells self-destruct. And, of course, the great thing about that is, of course, there's no toxic side effect to that, because the healthy cells are not, uh, are not uh, interfered with. Um, I mean, it's interesting research, but it's been going on for a while. I mean, the the cancer-fighting qualities of fever few were identified back in 2005, you know, 15 years ago or so. Um, and they, they found, again, it was killing off leukemia cells, and again, without any toxic side effects. And what was particularly interesting with this 2005 study was it, it was tested against the standard leukemia drug and a chemotherapy drug and was found to be better. <laughs> I mean, it was um, the, the drug itself was only modestly toxic, whereas the, uh, the fever few was extremely toxic to the cancer cells. But the uh, chemo was horse, highly toxic to the healthy cells. So it was killing the healthy cells and sort of attacking in a mild way the cancer cells, whereas the fever view was doing exactly the opposite. It was attacking the cancer cells and leaving the healthy cells alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what's going to end up happening. If um, the drug companies get hold of this, they're going to want to take and isolate that compound parthenolide mm. or parthenolide and then turn it into an expensive drug. Yeah. Um, but here's the really interesting part of this. We are now discovering with a few studies here and there that all kinds of things, all kinds of substances can kill cancer easily. Mm. You know, we thought of cancer as the big deadly thing mm. that can't be sorted. Mm. But we, you know, you've reported recently, Brian, on virology, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that scientists are um, playing around with viruses like the measles virus. Mm -hmm. And when it's injected into cancer, mm -hmm. um, it kills it without killing the mm -hmm. healthy cells. Yeah. And I think more and more, there's going to be a move of forcing of the issue as Drug companies fail to cure cancer as they're mm. failing to cure cancer. We're losing the war on cancer. We're not winning it, despite all the bandwagon stuff and all of the <clears throat> triumphalism. Mm. We are losing the war on cancer. We're, you know, the, uh, 
the actual success rate is pitifully small. Yes, yeah, very small. And the <clears> trouble <throat> is that medicine's an autocratic system. You know, the patient doesn't have a vote mm -hmm. and gets what is given unless you know <clears throat> he or she is smart enough to read what doctors don't tell you. They aren't necessarily going to know about this stuff, and so don't do it. And they just go with the doctor, and um, the doctor himself is not necessarily being trained in this because. He is reliant for his ongoing uh, education from the drug company who happened to make the drug that he happens to use. And I mean, the interesting thing is there are a lot of people out there who are having success with cancer mm. um, around the world who are mm. doing extraordinary work, uh, doctors and other researchers. So if you do have cancer and you don't want to go the conventional route, it really behooves you to do your research, not panic, do your research and find out about alternatives. We certainly have written about, we've reported on many, many people who have beaten cancer with alternative means. There is always hope, Lynn. So thank you for that. Lyme disease, a terrible debilitating problem that is affecting more and more people. In truth, we don't know how many. But it's many, many thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who are suffering debilitating conditions as a result of being bitten by a tick that is carrying the Lyme disease. And there they thought the story ended and started, in fact. But you know what? It doesn't. There's a stage before that which researchers are now starting to look at. Because the question was, how come the tick has the Lyme disease um, bacteria? Well, the answer is because the tick had been feeding on the white-footed mouse. And the white-footed mouse is the ultimate carrier of the Lyme disease bacteria. So the tick feeds off the mouse and the tick then bites the human and the human gets Lyme disease. So why does this matter? Well, it matters for a number of reasons, because it could mean if we now know that the origins of Lyme disease actually rest with the white-footed mouse and not with the tick, we have more chance of controlling the problem, because controlling ticks is very, very difficult, whereas controlling white-footed mice is easier. And one suggestion that University of California Irvine has is vaccination. Of course, that's one re approach. But they've actually also, this is what I think is particularly interesting, they've done a complete DNA profile of the white-footed mouse, and they've asked the question, well, why is it? If the mouse is carrying the bacteria of the Lyme disease, it doesn't get infected itself. And what is interesting about this, and I think is open for discussion, and I'll say at this point, no more, no less. But the mouse is actually not just carrying Lyme bacteria, it's also carrying a form of viral encephalitis and malaria and diseases like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Now, what are some of the symptoms of Lyme disease? Well, aren't they things like viral encephalitis and, mm. and, and debilitating problems like fever? So I'm wondering, is Lyme disease actually these other things? I've just put that out there for, for discussion. But anyway, it's, you know, for those of people who have Lyme disease or worried about it, maybe this actually is a positive step. We're a step closer to controlling the problem. Absolutely. I think that's a really important thing. And also, people should know that there are ways of treating it. I was talking to a doctor recently who treats it with homeopathy, believe it or not. He gives his patients with Lyme disease uh, the Lyme tick spirochete, which is the um, oralis, I think it is. Yes, that's right. The, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he gives that to them in a 200 potency of homeopathy. Mm -hmm. And he gives just one pill, I think it's three times over uh, consecutive weeks. So just one, wait a week, another one, wait a week, take a third one, something like that. Mm. And he is reversing Lyme disease with mm. this tiny, simple, easy 
painless and side effect free approach. Mm. So it behooves you to work with a homeopath, a licensed homeopath, if you're going to look at that route. Mm. But he's having great success with it. Um, and there are also, uh, you know, other people looking at other ways of eradicating this, um, this disease. But as you say, it could be not just one mm. infection. It could mm. be a number of infections yeah. that you're getting. Yeah. So that's why it is difficult to treat yeah. in many well, cases. Well, maybe Lyme's just the name for these other infections. Yeah. Like encephalitis. Could be. Or fever. And they call it Lyme disease, but actually that doesn't exist. That's just a name. And that the actual infections are the encephalitis and fever. It could be. Uh, and you see, this is the sort of fascinating insights you get when you listen to the What Doctors podcast. I mean, it's, I wish I could sit there and listen to it myself then. <laughs> but there you are, I can't. A fact a minute. It, it, at least. Anyway, that's enough from me for another week. So um, check us out, What Doctors Don't Tell You, WDDTY.com. I'm Brian Hubbard. Thank you for listening or viewing. I'm Lynn McTaggart, and we look forward to connecting with you next time.